The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, or the ADA, was signed into law on July 26, 1990, by President George H. W. Bush, and later amended with changes effective January 1, 2009. The ADA is a wide-ranging civil rights law that prohibits, under certain circumstances, discrimination based on disability. It affords similar protections against discrimination to Americans with disabilities as the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which made discrimination based on race, religion, sex, national origin, and other characteristics illegal. Disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. The determination on whether any particular condition is considered a disability is made on a case-by-case -case basis. Certain specific conditions are excluded as disabilities, such as current substance abuse and visual impairment, which is correctable by prescription lenses. Although transsexuality is recognized as a medical condition, transsexuals are not covered under federal laws that prohibit discrimination on the basis of disability. Both the Federal Act of 1973 and the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA of 1990, explicitly exclude transsexuals from protection. On September 25, 2008, President George W. Bush signed into law the ADA Amendments Act of 2008, or the ADAAA. It is intended to give broader protections for disabled workers and turn back the clock on court rulings which Congress deems too restrictive. The ADAAA includes a list of impairments to major life activities. Contents 1. Employment, Services, and Accommodations 1.1 1. 1. Title I Employment 1.2 Title II Public Services and Public Transportation 1.3 Title III Public Accommodations and Commercial Facilities 1.4 Title IV Telecommunications 1.5 Title V Miscellaneous Provisions 2 Major Life Activities 3 Political Pressure 4 Quote, five, criticism, 5.1, employment, 5.2, accessibility, 5.3, extra exam time, 6, ADA case law, 7, resources, 8, see also, 9, external links, 10. References. Employment, Services, and Accommodations. Title I. Employment. The ADA states that a covered entity shall not discriminate against a qualified individual with a disability. This applies to job application procedures, hiring, advancement and discharge of employees, workers' compensation, job training, and other terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. Covered entity can refer to an employment agency, labor organization, or joint labor management committee, and is generally an employer engaged in interstate commerce and having 15 or more workers. Discrimination may include, among other things, limiting or classifying a job applicant or employee in an adverse way, denying employment opportunities to people who truly qualify, or not making reasonable accommodations to the known physical or mental limitations of disabled employees, not advancing employees with disabilities in the business, and or not providing needed accommodations and training. 
Employers can use medical entrance examinations for applicants after making the job offer only if all applicants, regardless of disability, must take it and if it is treated as a confidential medical record. Qualified individuals do not include any employee or applicant who is currently engaging in the illegal use of drugs when that usage is the basis for the employer's actions. Part of Title I was found unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court in the case of Board of Trustees of the University of Alabama v. Garrett as violating the sovereign immunity rights of the several states as specified by the 11th Amendment to the United States Constitution. This provision allowing private suits against states for money damages was invalidated. Title II, Public Services and Public Transportation. Title II has two sections. One covers public agencies, local, county, state, etc., government, and their units. That section generally requires the agencies to comply with regulations similar to Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. These rules cover access to all programs offered by the entity. Access includes physical access described in the Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards or the ADA standards for accessible design and access that might be obstructed by discriminatory policies or procedures of the entity. The other section of Title II is specific to public transportation provided by public entities. It includes the National Railroad Passenger Corporation along with all other commuter authorities. This section requires the provision of paratransit services by public entities. Both sections state that a public entity can be any state or local government or any department or agency thereof. The lack of accessibility or certain services can be considered discrimination regardless of who it actually affects. For example, a lack of wheelchair accessibility in passenger cars or even the leasing of wheelchair inaccessible ones without a good faith attempt to lease wheelchair accessible ones is considered discrimination under the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Title III, Public Accommodations and Commercial Facilities. Under Title III, no individual may be discriminated against on the basis of disability with regards to the full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, or accommodations of any place of public accommodation by any person who owns, leases, or leases to, or operates a place of public accommodation. Public accommodations include most places of lodging, such as inns and hotels, recreation, transportation, education, and dining, along with stores, care providers, and places of public displays, among other things. This implies the presence of an ADA compliance kit in places of public accommodations. Most of the lawsuits filed under Title III of the ADA deal with the physical conditions or accessibility of physical places. Under Title III of the ADA, all new construction, construction, modification, or alterations, after the effective date of the ADA, approximately July 1992, must be fully compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act Accessibility Guidelines, the ADAAG, found in the Code of Federal Regulations at 28C.F.R. Part 36, Appendix A. Perhaps even more importantly, Title III also has application to existing facilities. One of the definitions of discrimination under Title III of the ADA is a failure to remove architectural barriers in existing facilities. This means that even facilities that have not been modified or altered in any way 
after the ADA was passed, still have obligations. The standard is whether removing barriers, typically defined as bringing a condition into compliance with the ADAAG, is readily achievable, defined as easily accomplished without much difficulty or expense. The statutory definition of readily achievable calls for a balancing test between the cost of the proposed fix and the wherewithal of the business and or owners of the business. Thus, what might be readily achievable for a sophisticated and financially capable corporation might not be readily achievable for a small mom and pop outfit. There are exceptions to this title. Many private clubs and religious organizations may not be bound by Title III. With regard to historic properties, those properties that are listed or that are eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places, or properties designated as historic under state or local law, those facilities must still comply with the provisions of Title III of the ADA to the maximum extent feasible. But if following the usual standards would threaten to destroy the historic significance of a feature of the building, then alternative standards may be used. Nonetheless, as Frank Bow predicted when he testified as the lead witness on Title III in the Senate hearings leading up to enactment, the fact that Title III calls for accessibility in, and alterations to, many thousands of stores, restaurants, hotels, etc., in many thousands of communities across the U.S., means that this title probably has had more effect on the lives of more Americans with disabilities than any other ADA title. Title IV, Telecommunications. Title IV of the ADA amended the Landmark Communications Act of 1934, primarily by adding Section 47, USC 225. This section requires that all of the 1,600-some-odd telecommunication companies in the U.S. take steps to ensure functionally equivalent services for consumers with disabilities, notably those who are deaf or hard of hearing, and those with speech impairments. When Title IV took effect in the early 1990s, it led to installation of public teletypewriter, TTY, machines, and other TDDs, telecommunications device for the deaf. Title IV also led to creation in all 50 states and the District of Columbia of what were then called dual party relay services and are now known as telecommunications relay services, TRS. Today, many TRS mediated calls are made over the internet by consumers who use broadband connections. Some are video relay service, VRS, calls, while others are text calls. In either variation, communication assistants translate between the signed, typed words of consumer and the spoken words of others. In 2006, according to the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, VRS calls averaged 2 million minutes a month. Title V, Miscellaneous Provisions Title V includes technical provisions. It discusses, for example, the fact that nothing in the ADA amends, overrides, or cancels anything in Section 504. Additionally, Title V includes an anti-retaliation or coercion provision. The Technical Assistance Manual for the ADA explains it. 111-3.6000 Retaliation or Coercion Individuals who exercise their rights under the ADA or assist others in exercising their rights are protected from retaliation. The prohibition against retaliation or coercion applies broadly to any individual or entity that seeks to prevent an individual from exercising his or her rights or to retaliate against him or her for having exercised those rights. Any form of retaliation or coercion, including threats, intimidation, or interference, is prohibited if it is intended to interfere with the exercise of rights under the ADA.
Major Life Activities The ADA defines a covered disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, was charged with interpreting the 1990 law with regard to discrimination in employment. Its regulations narrowed substantially limits to significantly or severely restricts. In 2008, effective January 1, 2009, the ADAAA broadened the interpretations and added to the ADA examples of major life activities, including, but not limited to, caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, standing, lifting, bending, speaking, breathing, learning, reading, concentrating, thinking, communicating, and working, as well as the operation of the several specified major bodily functions. The Act overturns a 1999 U.S. Supreme Court case which held that an employee was not disabled if the impairment could be corrected by mitigating measures. It specifically provides that such impairment must be determined without considering such ameliorative measures. Another court restriction overturned is the interpretation that such an impairment that substantially limits one major life activity must also limit others to be considered a disability. The ADAAA will undoubtedly lead to broader coverage of impaired employees. The United States House Committee on Education and Labor states that the amendment makes it absolutely clear that the ADA is intended to provide broad coverage to protect anyone who faces discrimination on the basis of disability. Political Pressure The ADA 1990 is unusual because more than a hundred groups dedicated to disability rights, civil rights, and social justice work together to ensure its passage. Justin Dart was a major organizer. Many of the standards mandated by the national government for the ADA were first incorporated by Ruth B. Cowell, who established and operated the Cowell Rehabilitation Center in Laredo, Texas, from 1959 until her death in 2008. Quote, On signing the measure, George H. W. Bush said, I know there may have been concerns that the ADA may be too vague or too costly or may lead endlessly to litigation, but I want to reassure you right now that my administration and the United States Congress have carefully crafted this act. We've all been determined to ensure that it gives flexibility, particularly in terms of the timetable of implementation, and we've been committed to containing the costs that may be incurred. Let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. Criticism Employment The ADA has been a frequent target of criticism. For example, some claim that individuals who are diagnosed with one of the so-called lesser disabilities are being accommodated when they should not be. The ADA has also been subject to harsh ridicule. The Onion ran a story in 1998 about the new Americans with No Abilities Act, which was described a major victory for the millions upon millions of U.S. citizens who lack any real skills or uses. On the other hand, court decisions have made necessary an individualized assessment to prove that an impairment is protected under the ADA. Therefore, the plaintiff must offer evidence that the extent of the limitation caused by the impairment is substantial in terms of his or her own experience. A medical diagnosis or physician's declaration of disability is no longer